I've always enjoyed Timothy Zahn's Star Wars books, from the original Thrawn trilogy, which largely set up the expanded universe novels and legends, to the new canon Thrawn trilogy, which covers how Thrawn entered the Empire, and even the newest Thrawn trilogy, the Thrawn Ascendancy trilogy. Today, though, we're going to be talking about Outbound Flight, where it honestly kind of feels like it's set up as a very specific defense of the Iraq War, though the book is one of my favorites. First, I'll give a bit of background on the book, then we'll cover where that point of comparison comes from, and why I don't think it holds up especially well in that context. But we'll finish with how some of the problems I see in it actually do get addressed in the newer Thrawn books a bit. Zahn is one of the few authors who really goes into the other factions beyond the standard Rebel or New Republic in Empire Conflicts, or the Republican CIS, with his development of the Chiss especially, so that's always fun for me to see in his books. One element of the Chiss is a hard and fast rule forbidding preemptive strikes. This gets first established in Vision of the Future, released in 1998, which is set about 20 years after the Battle of Endor. In that book, the leaders of Thrawn's faction, the Empire of the Hand, are talking to Mara Jade and mention Thrawn's ambush of the outbound flight, the ship, not the novel, and describe how to the Chiss, Thrawn's preemptive strike against it was basically just murder. A decade after Vision of the Future was released, we got the full story of what happened with the release of Outbound Flight, the novel, not the ship. The Outbound Flight project was planned by the Republic to send six dreadnoughts linked around a central core full of supplies throughout the unknown regions to colonize a few planets and then potentially reach another galaxy. They chose basically the slowest ships they could for that, but we won't hold that against them. Palpatine sent agents in charge of a Trade Federation task force to destroy it. Fearing their discovery would push forward an invasion by the extragalactic Yuzon Vong, not realizing that the novels for that had already been released so they were good for another 50 years. Thawne intercepted and destroyed the task force as you'd expect, before confronting the outbound flight himself, though its full destruction was largely an accident in the final version. Most relevant to this topic, the books also focus on Thrawn's desire to defeat the Vagari, another minor power in the Chiss's region of space which made a habit of preying on other, weaker planets and species. Thrawn saw them as a potential threat to the Chiss, but because of the Chiss military doctrine, he was not legally able to attack them, either to destroy them as a threat, or in defense of the Vagari's victims. After reading the book a few times, and having read some historical documents that we'll get to later, I started feeling more and more like it might be a reference to the Iraq War in some way, a specific conception of the Iraq War, which we will get to. So I started trying to look into Zahn's interviews to see if he'd ever said anything about those elements of the story. In an interview with TheForce.net, which I can't find a date for, so I'm not sure when he said this, but which I will link in the description, he said the following, quote, Outbound Flight is a perfect example where Thrawn and the others wrestle with the morality of preemptive strikes, particularly against someone who's busily preying on the helpless. I tried to lay out reasoned arguments for both sides, that'll become important later, allowing the readers to assess the question for themselves, and without forcing them in either direction. The point is that by using Thrawn in Star Wars, I could discuss the issue without ever bringing up the word Iraq and the whole spectrum of emotions it invokes." End quote. Now, some people may just want to stop there and say authors or filmmakers or whomever shouldn't be inserting their views or real-world issues into fiction, but I'm absolutely not saying that, even if I disagree with the specifics of how it's implemented. That's basically how all fiction works. Zahn prefaces that quote by saying, quote, One of the strengths of science fiction in general is the ability to deal with complex issues of the real world without hitting hot buttons that might otherwise cloud the issue, end quote. And that's something I do totally agree with, and it's something which most writers would probably agree with as well when talking about their own work. That being said, I think when looking at Outbound Flight in the context of Zahn's own words, it falls short of what he's saying in a few ways. For one thing, the idea that he's written it in such a way that he's laying out the reasoned arguments for both sides, without forcing the reader to either one, doesn't really hold up. I think it's important to look at this before getting to the direct connection with the Iraq War, since it's important in understanding how the conflict is being framed, so we'll mostly talk about that first. Thrawn is of course framed as the protagonist, but anytime someone doubts Thrawn in the book, they're pretty clearly shown to be wrong for having done so. Thrawn and Jorz Kardas, as the book's main characters, are basically on the same page about which actions ought to be taken, and the need to stop the Vagari, and it's mostly about other people coming around to their way of seeing things. The arguments against Thrawn attacking the Vagari come from other Chiss characters mostly associated with the Chiss government. 
those being Admiral Aralani, aristocrat Shaft Form Bintrano or Formby, and Thrawn's own brother Thras. Rather than any real examination of their positions, their arguments are mostly just appeals to the fact that it would be illegal, with them each having their own moral stance on it that's kind of implied as well. Aralani largely tries to help Thrawn as much as she can. She mostly just opposes his moves on the grounds that he's going to get exiled and he's too brilliant to be worth losing. The implication there, I suppose, that she knows he's doing the right thing, but is being held back by her adherence to the law. Thras tends to be one of the more staunch defenders of the legal requirements, but once Thrawn successfully wipes out the Vigari fleet and frees the captive Jeroons, he comes around as well. Cardas points at the free Jeroons and tells him, quote, I defy you to look at these people and tell me how freeing them from tyranny could possibly be immoral, end quote. To which Thras says, The morality of an action is not determined by the results, still in this case it's a hard point to argue. Formby's objections to Thrawn's action come less from any stated moral opposition as well, but instead again from the law and family politics, which is an important part of Chiss government portrayed as similarly detrimental to proper progress. I think Aralani is the most interesting character here because there's at least some more nuance to that, where it's looking at an actual conflict between her own potential moral position and the fact that what she is probably supporting is illegal. But when the entire opposition to Thrawn is largely just because it's illegal, rather than there being any moral arguments put up against it, I don't think you're actually capturing both sides of that issue. And again, I don't think it's wrong for a book to have a point of view. That's going to come out regardless, like I mentioned before. George Lucas didn't do any of his commentary in the original trilogy with the expectation that the audience could or should come away with it, being able to reach the conclusion that he'd given them the tools to decide they were in favor of the Vietnam War. And it's not a flaw with the movies that he didn't. That said, rather than burning down some straw men, you can portray a nuanced set of positions while still clearly having a conclusion you've reached. Staying within Star Wars, I think Andor is an especially good example of giving characters and positions nuance, while also still very clearly not being sympathetic to the positions held by some of those characters. Given those examples from Outbound Flight, which are pretty representative of how the book handles these issues overall, I don't think the idea that he was just laying out both sides and leaving room for the audience to decide like he says he's doing holds much water. And while it may seem like this whole both sides thing is a separate point from how it represents the Iraq War, I'm bringing it up as much as I am because I think it is a very important element of the framing of that war which indicates where the ideas are coming from. So don't worry, this is all still relevant to that as well. Thras gives a weak statement about the outcome not being what's important, but that was more going back to his defense of the law being the law, rather than what I think would be a more valid or interesting point about how you can't always just expect things to work out perfectly like it does for Thrawn here. There's another element of the Vagari where they shield their ships with little hull bubbles containing their captives. That could have been examined more as a potential avenue to look at some of the possible costs of Thrawn's actions, but that gets entirely subverted by Thrawn disabling the ships and freeing them all. There's really not much of a moral analysis there made in the book via either the means or the outcome. In the lead up to it, there could have been more of an examination of what the body shields could have meant for Thrawn's position, as well as the people directly involved, even if you're going to have it be solved as a problem. But instead it's only looked at as a way to build suspense by putting Cardas in one, which he escapes from, and to show how bad the Vagari are. Thrawn basically gets an audience rooting for him when he's dealing with the legal repercussions of his actions as well. A discussion in which Arlani again focuses on those legal issues with what he's done, saying the fleet can only protect him so far. Thrawn responds with, understand in turn that I will continue to protect my people in whatever way I deem necessary, to which Aralani expresses her own approval. The problem again is that the things he's deemed necessary so far have been pretty clearly framed as moral in their own right, rather than ever really calling up a discussion of whether the ends justify the means, or whether the framework is correct in the first place, since none of the means end up even having any cost on the Vigari side in particular. On the outbound flight side, the opposition of Jedi Master Sabayoth, who is running the outbound flight mission, leads to Thrawn expending extra resources and ultimately dooming the ship when his own crew counterattacks with weapons that were meant to be used against the Vigari, while Joris Sabayoth is using Force Choke on Thrawn. This means that in the three-way battle between outbound flight, Thrawn's task force, and the Vigari fleet, the outbound flight ends up getting doomed as well. There's never really any culpability of Thrawn examined for that in the resulting deaths of the colonists or his brother Thras, who ends up on outbound flight during its ultimate crash. The new Ascendancy trilogy has a similar issue where it tries to frame Thrawn as having made more of these moral sacrifices to reach what he sees as a necessary end, 
but even though Thrawn is clearly a villain in the original Thrawn trilogy, books where he's used as the protagonist do seem to have a problem acknowledging that or putting him in those positions again. So, far from setting up a situation where the reader makes up their own mind, it seems to mostly reveal Zahn's own conception of the Iraq War at the time, and again, it's him that made that explicit connection between that war and the themes he is exploring. The reason it stuck out to me and that I made the connection myself is because this framing of it is actually very similar, almost identical, to the framing used by the neoconservative movement in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq throughout the 90s and the early 2000s when they were arguing in favor of it. To again highlight the idea in his words that he's portraying the reasoned arguments for both sides, the book is actually engaging with a very specific framing of Iraq, the war, and American interventionism more generally, taking its premises for granted in the book's exploration of these issues, and then taking both sides as being either for or against intervention when viewed within that specific lens. The neoconservative movement in the United States included groups like the Project for the New American Century or PNAC, a think tank which was pushing for more military spending and a more interventionist role for America in the 90s. They basically viewed the world in terms of good and evil states, and they believed after the fall of the USSR that America needed to continue an activist role globally, with as much defense spending as possible to intervene on behalf of American interests, something they would argue was ultimately for the good of everyone. To quote the PNAC's 1997 Statement of Principles, The history of the 20th century should have taught us that it is important to shape circumstances before crises emerge, and to meet threats before they become dire, end quote. The following year, they sent a letter to President Clinton, where they directly put Iraq and Saddam as the new foe for America, following their disappointment earlier in the decade when the first Gulf War under H.W. Bush didn't end up with the removal of Saddam and the installation of a governor who was friendly to the state's interests. Most of the signatories to those documents and members of the PNAC itself went on to be members of the Bush administration, as well as directly involved in the Iraq War the failures of which arguably contributed more to public opinion turning against their positions on how foreign policy should work than anything since the Vietnam War. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. In the neoconservative framework, the kind of interventionism they were arguing for universally went hand in hand with being a moral good and being to the benefit of the people who inhabited those countries, regardless of how little they actually thought about the well-being of the people most affected. And I do think this is where the framework lines up most with how Zahn presents things in Outbound Flight. It's not an examination on the morality of preemptive strikes per se, it's an exploration of this neoconservative framework. There really isn't much engaging with the actual opposition to those viewpoints in the book. Generally, I would argue that intervention done unilaterally on the basis of assuming the material interest of your state will just benefit everyone else without understanding the situation you're going into will probably fail and will probably not actually solve the problem you think you're solving. It's not like this is some new problem faced with the Iraq War either, but it's one which Iraq does pretty clearly bear out partially as a direct result of the neoconservatives' own unwillingness to engage with the reality of the situation beyond their own biases and the idea of, for example, Vice President Dick Cheney's statement that they would be greeted as liberators, contrary to intelligence beforehand that indicated insurgency would become a problem that they had no real plan to deal with. By framing the Vagari as roving bands of pirates who were collectively the problem, there's an indication of the weakness in there being a metaphor for the Iraq War, as well as more indication that the neoconservative conception of international relations is what's being operated under. Outbound Flight isn't dealing with regime change or the nuances of how a society works, or what happens when you create a power vacuum with no real reference to the needs of the people. It's setting up one specific enemy fleet to beat, where the Vagari are a monolith and are the problem. All you have to do is face down that one fleet, and when you win that battle, you've solved the problem. The Jeroons, who are the people being helped by Thrawn's intervention most directly in this battle, have no agency, and are ultimately just presumably grateful set dressing. When you're trying to frame the need to help them as the moral issue, the fact that the only real stakes in the scene that they're involved in are created not with reinforcing a worry about them, but with putting Cardass in the shield bubbles I mentioned before, it highlights that deficiency just a bit more. Obviously, nobody would expect a one-to-one -one correlation between the issues he's trying to discuss and the book's events, but I think when you're trying to frame your book as a commentary on that type of issue, 
and there's no actual discussion of the groups you're trying to help, whether that's leadership, grassroots action, or really any involvement with the people directly impacted at all, you're showing a weakness not just with your symbolism, but with your conception of the issue at hand, which correlates to the problem with the neoconservative conception. Now, this is actually an element we'll get back to in a moment on the more positive side for some of the things that Zahn does later, so hold on to that thought. But as it is an outbound flight, it undermines the ability to say that this is an issue which he is exploring both sides' reasoned arguments for. Instead, it reduces it to a simple question of, should the bad guys be stopped? Some people say no, which I don't find to be a particularly useful way to look at it. Maybe this is my fault for having read way too many neoconservative documents engaging with their conception of the world in the Iraq War and University, but it's hard for me to not read Outbound Flight without all this coming through, especially having seen that interview. To be clear, while this video obviously has some pretty clear disagreements with the framing, especially when compared with how the interview positions it, I still do enjoy the book, and I'm not trying to use this as a personal attack on Zahn or something. It's again entirely possible that the comparisons I've drawn aren't necessarily what he intended, though I do stand by my analysis of what's there as presented. Now, you could argue with the both sides thing, it's showing the difference between being an involved member of the world versus just saying nothing anywhere is actually your problem and hiding behind the law for that. But that still leaves the pro-intervention arguments being framed in a very specific way. Now, all that aside, a Star Wars story detailing the morality of the Chiss's isolationism in that framework could definitely be interesting, and I think there's elements of what I'm criticizing here which Zahn actually executes on much better in the more recent Thrawn Ascendancy trilogy. A lot of the issues being examined are the same or similar, but it sheds a lot of the specific neoconservative framing of the Iraq War. Primarily, there's a lot more elements of Thrawn taking that more active form for the Chiss, but through more local collaboration and coalition building, giving an active role and voice to the people allegedly being protected, rather than examining it solely from the perspective of one local superpower acting unilaterally when and how they choose, despite having no reference to anyone else as it happens in Outbound Flight. Either way, that's going to do it for today. This touched upon some real-world history, so if you're interested in more of that, I did recently launch a real-world history channel named Common History, which I'll link to in the comments as well as on the end screen. Datapad videos have been coming in a lot more slowly than usual while I work on that, and for the videos that I have been doing here on Datapad, I've mostly been going for some of the bigger topics that I've been meaning to do for a while, which often takes a lot more time to do. As much as I enjoy doing the big campaign breakdowns and such, those also take a lot of time, so I'm hoping to eventually get to the point where I can hire some extra editing help, which should make it a bit easier to cover everything I'd like, but we're not quite there yet. If there is anything else you'd like to see specifically covered, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.